quite amazed, I've got to say, quite amazed. Really exciting. It was, oh my gosh, something's happening here. I really didn't believe what I felt. That's the power behind creation, isn't it? So it is powerful. You know, where do you go from here? When people use the dowsing tool and it starts to operate on its own and they realise that they're getting answers to questions from a, a source they've never gone into before, they realise the possibilities of dowsing. You can be led up the garden path with dowsing very easily and as you do more of it you can sense whether you're fooling yourself. You just have to accept what comes, and it can be no, you know, the answer is not what you want, you know, and you have to accept it. When you douse, you can douse for anything. If the intention is there, you get help to find the answers. It is possible to extend consciousness to whatever you want to do. And in fact, the old Greeks had a thing where, when they were looking at, um, uh, at, at an object, they felt that they were actually sending something out to run over the object instead of just receiving the information. We all have the ability to be able to paint, divine, do whatever, be the, the best mathematician in the world. It's all there, we're able to do it, but we need the trigger to start it. Learning to douse and practicing the art of dowsing has been a life-changing experience for me. The thing about dowsing is everybody thinks it's about water, but it's about many other things. It's about things like earth energy, and this is when I started learning. This is the hurlers, and I started learning about earth energy here. I've been following an energy line and it came right the way through here, in fact, through this stone, through the centre. And it started to go up towards the cheese ring up here. I had never heard of the cheese ring before and this is the place that led me into a really deep investigation of Earth energy. And the lovely thing about dowsing is that everybody can do it. And how good you are depends entirely on how much you're prepared to practice. Of course, dowsing is, is probing into a sense beyond the five. And dowsers actually are, are usually fiercely independent people who are not afraid to question standards that they've lived with for a long time. They usually have the courage to probe into areas that, that other people don't. The first real practical history of, of dowsing was by Herodotus the Greek, the father of all history. Fourth century BC, uh, the Scythians, and he was, he was reporting uh, what was happening in, in Scythia. And they used um, forked sticks, he said, cut from the hedges to find water. And that's the first real record of the, of the history. There's nothing much after that until the, the mid-Europeans started to, to uh, use dowsing, not just for water, but for finding minerals. Some people don't believe in dowsing and they say it doesn't work, but this is a case in point. This is Batalic Mine, goes two miles under the sea. And these Cornish industrialists didn't waste money. They, they, they paid good Cornish dowsers to find 15 inch deep seams in the granite. And these Cornish dowsers learned from a book called Dere Metallica which was written by a man called Georgius Agricola on metallurgy and the, and the techniques of dowsing. The whole uh, industry depended on the accuracy of the Cornish dowsers because otherwise they had to drill through many hundreds of feet of granite and these, these dowsers would tell them precisely where to drill. So it was the dowsing in the, in the Cornish tin industry that became so accurate and became such a respectable profession that it made an absolutely major contribution to many, many other industries in the country. Oh, 
I'm coming into the pure energy of this lovely St. Gilmore Church, one of my favourite churches, in a complete contrast to Batalic and the harshness of the industrial mining industry. And the Cornish Dowsers were gaining a tremendous uh, degree of respectability with the professionalism of their work in the, in, the, in the mining industry. By finding things which are actually beyond the five senses, they were saving the mining fraternity a huge amount of work. And they were quite well paid, actually, in, in Cornwall at that time. But there was controversy as well, because the um, church authorities were confusing the word divination in Deuteronomy 18 with divining. The two uh, conceptions got mixed up, because divination is foretelling the future. And divining is another word for dowsing, which is just finding things beyond the five senses. So there was, there was uh, some controversy about the legitimacy of dowsing. And the use of the forked stick was described as an abomination. Of course, the country people still needed water, so quite secretly they kept the art going. The amazing thing is that all churches and all sacred places, meeting places, will have a very special spot that people are drawn to. And it's a subtle energy spot and you can discover it by dowsing. And the wonderful thing is that this uh, vortex of energy, which is created there by prayer or by meditation, responds to human consciousness. Because churchyards are wonderful places to dive, so you can do all sorts of things. You can find out the earth energy centre of the, the churches, you can find out so many different things. Very famous people like Guy Underwood did masses of work on, on uh, recording underground streams and, and energy patterns all around churches and cathedrals and, and all sorts of ecclesiastical places. Of course, Guy Underwood made a very special dowsing tool of his own. Made a very, very thin wire and little, tiny loops and it piddled around in some way. And he was very, very accurate with it. I find it very difficult to use. And normally dowsing is done by uh, either a pendulum or a rod. And the pendulum looks something like, like that. And you, uh, you get results with it uh, whistling around either one way or the other. And the rod is something like that. Some of you might have decided to use rods or, or pendulums or anything else before. And each one of them it's, in itself is not important, but it's important that you relate to it, that it's part of you and it's an extension of you and it's a believable thing because you have to use it to develop a yes and no. And that, the whole basis of dowsing is about developing an accurate yes and no. There are more dowsing tools than there are dowsers. And the absolute basic tool is, is, is this one. This is the one that I talked before about. This was cut from a hedge and we have to tension it. The fellows have to be very careful because once you start to find the water, it goes like, like that. <laughs> the girls have an equal problem because very often when they start doing it, it goes up. And I've, and I've seen a great big lumps on their head. <laughs> very, very strong action. And of course it was, um, it, it, uh, was okay right through the centuries because some of the authorities didn't like dowsing. They called it divining and they said it was the work of the devil. And to walk about with a thing like that was like walking with a Kalashnikov. So what they did was uh, cut this from the hedge near where they had to work because the big thing was to find water. And uh, if anybody came along who was in authority, they'd just break it up, put it under their arm, and they were collecting sticks for the fire. We do a little one for the kids because they can't uh, tension them. A tiny little hazel twig there. And they, they do exactly the same thing. And it's great. The kids are wonderful because they reckon this old grey bearded fella could do it. They could do it too. There's never any question. And there's a, a lovely old chap called Jack Benny who makes um, lots of these tools. He's 80 something now. How can I say that? He's 80 something. I'm 80 something. <laughs> <laughs> He's an old man. <laughs> And that's a pair of horse whips with a little copper things on it. And, and that's just as effective. And you can even lose an old bit of curtain rod with a bit of, of tape around it. And you have to tension it in exactly the same way, but it has exactly the same effect. You pull it out and it's tensioned and it gives you your indication, the answer to your question. The, the important thing is, is, is the nature of the question.
In order to phrase the question, you've got to decide very, very precisely what you're looking for. You actually have to teach yourself a sequence of questions which get you nearer and nearer and nearer the target every time. And each time you use your yes and no and you go by whatever answer you get from there to phrase another question that gets you nearer what you're looking for. You must develop a very positive yes and no. A yes and no you can absolutely trust. Now this is difficult because what you're trying to do is to get rid of the answers that you are expecting from your logical mind. You're accessing a source of the answer to the question which is not from logic. It's from another part of your mind or your brain or from the etheric or whatever you like to call it. And you, you have to learn to access that. And the only way you can access it is to practice. And you find you're actually doubting properly when you get an answer to a question that is not the one you expected. Well, my name is Val Johnson and I douse for health. We find that the root cause of illness is often um, related to diet intolerances and allergies. When we're looking at diet, we're looking at whether people are um, have an intolerance to metals and environmental problems as well and beverages all across the board. When you douse, you can douse for anything. If the intention is there, you get help to find the answers. But keep it simple. Don't ask too many questions. Just keep it very simple. Just ask one question at a time to allow you know, the answer to come through. It's a very discreet model, which is fiberglass, which was used actually by a, a lovely American lady who was dousing in cathedrals. And she used to tension this thing and she was, she was quite plump with a fur coat. Nobody could see what she was doing, but she would douse it for energy in the, in the cathedrals in exactly the same way as you do with a big stick. This is the one I like. It's got a flattened handle on and I can tell the strength of the energy field on it because I can feel the, the thing turning. It's very difficult to do that with, with a round rod and this is why I use this, this flattened thing. And when I started and, 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 the, and the first piece of dowsing I did was to walk up the road up here and see whether there was any energy between St Michael's Mount and Trencrom. And I said, is there an energy line between Trencrom Hill and St Michael's Mount and I walked up the road and I just got that much and it changed my life completely and it's, it's, it's taken me around the world for the last 25 years. This one I made from 10 mil steel. There are some big forces, magnetic, earth magnetic forces around here and I just wanted to see how strong these forces were and I found that this had worked in exactly the same way. So I thought I'd crack it once and for all so I made some of these these rods are two and a half pounds weight and once you get them up there they're just as accurate as the other ones and they, they pull towards this, this magnetic force. So we're dealing with some, some extraordinary mysterious um, thing in dowsing that allows you to detect thing, forces that you can't normally detect. Now the other one it really intrigued me was by Alan Heiss, an American dowser, and he, he did a lot of his dowsing in cathedrals. And he used to uh, find the stuff like that. You wait till the priest passed and go, <laughs> There's a car aerial. This is one by, by Rodney Smith, a local uh, dowser in Devon, and he calls it his wiggly thing and it's about tensioning again he uses it in exactly the same way but he tensions this thing out and when, it, when he's over his target it flips over I find it slightly difficult to use but, but uh, a lot of people swear by it and this is a bobber and if you prefer the bobber it's uh, this uh, I'll, I'll just use that this, this little energy center here I'll just use that as a, as a, as a demonstration because when you use a bobber, I find it quite difficult, but with practice you can keep it pretty steady. And when you get over the point of the earth energy thing there, it starts wobbling. You don't even need to cut your wire coat hanger and make it into L rod. You can use it exactly as it is if you like, and it will indicate exactly the same way that a proper dowsing rod does. 
and you can even use a child's plastic one although it's very difficult to justify going down Penzance High Street with one of these. I'm Daphne Adams. I've been dowsing since 1985. That's officially dowsing because I've always had the sense that things go on all the time around you. And my younger daughter had an experience which was very unpleasant overnight and that caused me to contact somebody I knew who knew somebody who knew somebody who knew a dowser who came over with a pair of rods. I knew nothing about formal dowsing at all and doused around the house and around the grounds of the house to see if she could find the source of these happenings. And what really happened was that when she'd finished her dowsing, she said to me, do you want to have a go? To which the answer was always yes from me. And I walked down the, the pathway and down the very substantial angle that was our garden. And the rods went wild. So I was hooked. And ever since then, um, I've been involved in dowsing. I do all sorts of dowsing, from finding water, um, finding lost articles for people, no matter if it's a bunch of keys or a wedding certificate or a, uh, an animal or a lost person or a person who's disappeared on purpose, which of course alters things considerably. I don't know how map dowsing, dowsing started for me. Um, I love animals and I'm very close to animals and I get on well with animals with legs. And so therefore that is natural to me. I'm looking for a dog at the moment who's gone missing. I have posted yesterday the map back to the lady and marked on the map where I think she is. And they're going on the search next week, so I keep my fingers crossed firmly. Somebody contacted me a year or 18 months ago. She was in Wales, and she had a dog to whom she was very much attached. And there was a, a big hill, a, a slag heap, and the dog was out with somebody else for a walk and disappeared. And she rang me, and I got a picture in my mind. And I just drew a diagonal uh, line on a piece of paper as she was talking to me and put a dot. And I worked out the proportion afterwards, worked out the proportion, the layout of the ground, if you like. And she called in Cave Rescue. And so I sent the message back, I think she's here. And they got straight to her, which was no <laughs> very good for me. <laughs> but that, of course, doesn't always happen. Pendulums come in very many forms, and it's quite important to get something that you have a rapport with. You have to have the right feeling for it, and gradually, as you use it, you, you'll, you'll get used to that particular material, and you won't want to use any other. There's nothing wrong with using whatever material you like. Crystals have memory. There's a lot of business about cleaning crystals, but as, as far as I uh, can understand, um, you just clean it with intent, with your mind. You don't have to bury it for nine weeks in, in salt or sand or whatever. I mean, this thing will clear if you just intend it to be clear. Actually, it's nice to, to select something because it is an extension of you eventually. It's nice to, to have something that you like or that you relate to. My really favourite one is this because, and you could use uh, the, the pendulum you wear and it's always there and it's always very handy and uh, it's, a, it's a particularly favourite one of mine. And I think it's, it's, it's nice to have to, to use one as a tool that you, you wear a lot of the time because you become very attached to it. Some people actually like to use a pendulum for dowsing because it leaves a hand free. So they can run it down on a list of allergies, if you like. But of course, you can do that too with a, with a dowsing rod. But once you get used to a pendulum, and, and then keep on with it. I don't recommend that anybody changes. Once you establish your very positive yes and no, and, uh, and really can trust it. My favourite tools are, the, are these rods, because I, I do most of my work outside. So what you have to do to establish your yes and no is bring, always bring the rods up to the search position. Now the search position is a comfortable hold about 15 inches apart, about just slightly higher than your solar plexus because everything's working from that. And you have to establish what sort of movement these rods will have to indicate a positive yes and no. Absolutely fundamental to dowsing that you, you develop the ability of, of recording a yes 
and you begin to trust it. That's what dowsing is about. I'm not going to say the right thing to do, because there's no right thing to do with these things. Your particular yes and no will possibly be different from mine. I personally have to have a dynamic. I have to have the rods moving. You can't just stand there waiting for something to happen. You have to have a dynamic on them. So it loosens your body up, and, and that's the whole thing about dowsing. You loosen your body up, and you tighten up your mind and you concentrate on exactly it, and you ask uh, ask it to show you a yes. Now, my first yes was was simply that, with the two together. And my no was quite complicated. It used to do that sort of thing. And after a few months, I started working with, with one rod to get a yes and no. And mine is very, very simple. I ask a question, and I have the dynamic of movement on one way, and if the rod does not respond at all to my question. It means no. And if it turns like that, it's yes. And it's as simple as that. I'm not saying that's the way to do it. I'm saying that's the way it works for me and it's the simplest way to work. Now you will possibly get something else. You might get an, uh, a no out this way and a yes that way or whatever. Whatever it is, if you can trust it, that's what you, that's what you stick with. So mine is yes and no. The thing to do is to practice. Practice is very simple things, you know. Is the is the electric light bulb turned on? Yes. And and these sort of very, very simple questions. Until you get used to the movement of the rod or the pendulum. And then you start doing the slightly unknown ones, like tossing a coin and, and dozing whether it's a head or a tail. Now when you when you do that, you'll find that you you don't get better than the fifty fifty of chance to start with. But practice practice and repeat the practice and you'll find it goes from 50% to 60 to 65 to 70 percent and then you realize that you you can start trusting your yes or no. Once you've learned that and once you've learned the concentration that gives you the capacity to access this information from somewhere other than your logical brain then you're a dowser. <laughs>because the land is scheduled, it's, it's listed, um, I couldn't dig and so I discovered in reading the newspaper uh, about a man called Ted Fawcett, Edward Fawcett, who was chairman of the Garden History Society and helped the National Trust uh, find old garden designs through dowsing. I eventually was able to contact him and he came and he doused both mounds and the area of the DMV, Deserted Medieval Village. He discovered on the, uh, the DMV uh, tree pits across the hillside, which he said were about 10 paces apart. Three years later, we had a geophysical survey done of the Deserted Medieval Village area, just by the church, and they also came across these tree pits, which were seven meters apart, metric. And uh, this was the first validation of dowsing that I'd ever had, which was very, very exciting. Now perhaps we can have a look at uh, another form of dowsing, which is, is directional dowsing. This is a demonstration of directional dowsing with two rods. A very special rod has been lost in the field, concentrating totally on it, 100%. And I asked the rods where it is, what direction it's in, and there it is, that way. So it could be that way or that way. So I try again. And I've got another direction there. So I go towards it with the two rods. And hopefully where the rods cross. I will find the dowsing tool. Bingo. If I was saying it myself, I'd, I'd just use the one rod. Get the direction. Walk straight in on, in the direction the rod's taking me. And when I go over the target. I'd find it turned back on itself and where the handle is, is bingo. Because you can also do it with a pendulum. And it starts swinging in the direction of your target and you follow the direction of the swing in a direct line and keep walking until it starts indicating that you're over the spot. 
The thing about dowsing is you should start on something very, very simple, like something very obvious, because if you try and start with something like earth energy, it's such a complex uh, thing that you, you, you begin to lose heart. I want you to walk towards this rope and with your eyes open, knowing that it's there, rods akimbo, <laughs> and I want you to walk towards it very, very slowly and say, show me the rope. There you go. One, two, three, four. What you do here is concentrate 100% on the rope. Nothing else exists. And all you do is walk towards this thing and say, show me the rope, show me the rope, show me the rope, show me the rope. And the rods will cross right above the rope. Now, when you do it the first time, the, the rods might work maybe like that, maybe like that, maybe like that. It doesn't matter how they work to, uh, to start with. If you're getting a reaction, it's the start of dowsing. Very, very important. Now try it again. One, two. Wow, wonderful. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. There it so goes, there way. it goes. That's fine. It doesn't matter. Cause that's going, I'm that's going. Your, left, your right one's starting to go. That's it, that's it, that's yeah, it. That's, it. That's, that that's right, yes, yes. 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 Yeah, that's fine. that's fine. So it's absolute concentration. Walk towards the thing, walk towards the rope. Show me the rope, show me the rope, show me the rope. And you become the rope. You are the rope. You are the frequency of the rope. And then the rods just have to show you where it is. You can do it with a single rod, of course, if you, if you like, in, in exactly the same way. And you can also, if you like, do it with a pendulum. So you come up in exactly the same way with the pendulum. Show me the rope, show me the rope, and there it is. So no matter what tool you're using, it will react to your interpretation of the frequency of the rope. I use um, L rods which go out and cross, and that's what I demonstrate. Most people can use the air rods with very little problem at all. In my understanding, what actually happens is that you're, you specify precisely in your mind and in your, what you're looking for. Then you then access the information field, which then tells you where it is. And then you go out and the dowsing rods just act as an indicator to let you know where it is. And that, to me, is the technique of dowsing. Intuition is, in fact, accessing information in the information field. There are about two or three information fields, one of which is just above the physical, and that is what scientists and, and, and engineers access if they want information and they get intuitive information. Then there's another one which is mental, and then the third one which is spiritual. The scientists tend to believe that, in fact, that consciousness is within the fortress of the skull, as they call it. And that is it. And oh, it's only chemical, the things that are going on. Newton believed in this sort of thing. He was, and, and Flood and, and Hooke believed in this sort of thing and understood it. But they said, what we will do is to look at only something which we can physically touch. They didn't want to be burnt at the stake as heretics by the church. And that, he said, Anything above the physical will be in the province of the church and therefore we shan't do it. And as a result of that, that's why there's been this focus on the physical material things in science ever since. But now scientists are getting to this condition that they are more free and they're more confident. And using the scientific method which has been developed, which is extremely powerful, we're able to start looking at these other areas in a scientific method. This seems a very simple, almost stupid exercise, but it's very useful actually to enable you to practice using one rod to follow the contour of, of, of something on the ground or a pipe under the ground or a drain under the ground. Now, if you're right-handed, you walk on the left-hand side of wherever you've found, this, on this occasion the rope, and you pick up with the rod right over the rope and you hold the rod horizontally, quite firmly, 
Don't let it tilt to the left or right. Feel the delicate movements of the rod and actually follow them because it will take you along the contours. And you just follow where it goes. And this tells you exactly where the rope or the pipe is underground. <laughs> Concentrate on the rope. <laughs> rope, 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 rope. rope. And of course you can do this uh, in exactly the same way with a, with a pendulum and if the, if the wind doesn't blow it about too much you can just find whatever it is and then ask for the direction and, and very very carefully walk along in the direction that the pendulum points. And this is quite a delicate operation because you have to follow every time it very subtly moves round and you eventually trace the whole contour. You can save yourself a great deal of money by, by not having to dig in the wrong places. But having found where it is, you've got to find out how, how deep you have to go to find the pipe. And there are two ways of doing that, which I'll show you. First one is Bishop's Rule, named after one of, the, one of the clergy who invented the system. What you have to do is find whatever it is first, the pipe in this case, register where it is, bring your feet up to the position, and then you use your rod or your pendulum and you walk away from it the distance of the depth of whatever it is and you ask it to show you where how deep the pipe is and you measure it from there to there that gives you the depth you have to dig to find that pipe there's another way of doing it and that is by bracketing so you can actually stand on the pipe again and say is it more than 10 feet deep and that's my this is your use of your yes and no my, my mine says no it's not more than is it between five and ten feet deep? Yes. Is it between seven foot six and ten feet? No. So it's between five foot and seven foot six. Is it more than seven feet? Yes. Is it seven foot one? Is it seven foot two? Is it seven foot three? And that's the depth you've got to dig to get down to where the pipe is to get the leak. In a commercial sense, I started in the early 80s. I've had my own drilling company. We were very successful, um, but due to ill health, decided that um, perhaps the heavy work wasn't what I wanted to do. So now I just go to actually um, doing the divining side of it, which I can do, and get somebody else in that does all the heavy work. <laughs> So when I come in and I'm talking to the customer, I'm always divining up to a point. Uh, I'm talking, I'm always looking around, I look across, I say, ah, yeah, that's where I want to go. And if I keep looking back, my expression to it is, you can't take your eyes off it. And the case being, I look around the whole site, I still want to go there. No matter what I do, I want to go there. That's my first pull. And then when I start looking again, well, you could go back over here, but that's where it still tells me. And that's my first port of call. If that's convenient and suitable, then we come and drill a hole. I say see it, people say what do you see? The only way I can put it in that sense is, technically we have five senses. But to describe it to somebody, I would say to a sighted person, put it this way, um, describe the colour green to a blind man. I can't, you can't do that, I can't tell you what I see. I just know I feel I want to be up at that particular point and it takes me there. Now, one of the really delightful things about dowsing is, and it's probably the only method you can do it, but you can actually uh, measure human auras and chakras because they are just, just they are simply biomagnetic fields which surround our bodies. Very, very subtle energies which are profoundly affected by the uh, nuances of earth energies around us and it affects our behavior quite profoundly. When we started working first, I used to do it by, by hand and I used to be able to find uh, the aura, and you can do that. But when I started dowsing, I found that the aura was much further out. And you could follow it exactly as you follow the rope. You could follow the outside of somebody's aura just by following what the, the rod does. And it should be 
centrally balanced around the spine. I do a lot of experiments with this when we're doing teaching and get people to douse each other's aura and they find it absolutely fascinating how the, how the aura varies and the size of the chakras and the biomagnetic fields change. I'm inside your heart chakra just now and the easiest way is, is to be inside it and say, show me, as you said, show me the rope, show me the heart chakra. Yeah, it's out here. Heart chakras are very big, and if you're, you're doing a heart chakra, it takes you through the walls and out the windows and over the furniture. So dowsers being a lazy crowd, they say, show me the heart chakra a third of its size. That's the thing about dowsing, there's no end to the things you can do when you ask the right questions. So that saves you climbing around the furniture. Yeah. And what you're trying to do is find out if there are any lumps out of the heart chakra. Every living being has an aura, and particularly with trees, you can work with trees and they actually react to our consciousness. So in the classes, what I like to do is ask the pupils, if you like, to select a tree that attracts them and just go up to it and acknowledge it. And then douse its aura, because every tree has an aura and, and they, they are all different sizes. And I ask them to douse it first, before they, they start working with the tree at all, just douse where the aura is. And mark the outside edge of it. And that indicates where the outside edge is, just about there. So if I mark that with a stick, and then I ask them to go and, and hug the tree, uh, consciously say to it, you are beautiful. And let the tree know that you, you, you think it's absolutely gorgeous and it's a wonderful piece of, of, of natural being that you have a great rapport with and you can hug it and you can love it and really communicate with it. Now the tree responds to the sincerity of your communication. It knows whether you're paying lip service in this hug or not. So you go out and you douse it again and see if its aura has changed. And yes, it has. The outside edge of this aura is now coming out here. It was there. So you can see that's almost a third bigger. So the tree has responded to a conscious acknowledgement of it, a, a, a declaration that you think it's beautiful. And there are four items that really are important to become a good dowser. The first one is practice. The second one is practice. The third one is practice. And even if you begin to doubt your ability to do it, more practice. You can do general dowsing and that's fine, it's very satisfying. But if you really want to get into dowsing in a way that is, is really valid, then you have to become a specialist in some particular subject that, that interests you. It can be archaeology, it can be earth energy, it can be healing, it can be allergies, it can be anything. Because the big thing about dowsing is, is that there are no limitations. I don't know how map dowsing, dowsing started for me. Um, I remember very early on Somebody asked me if I could find a little kitten who had gone off. And I'm not sure what skill I used, to be honest. I thought about where it was and I drew a little sketch of the area. And yet I tuned into the kitten in a different sort of way and found her. When I'm dowsing for diets and things, particular food jump out at me on a page without me having to douse. I was told that that would happen and as the more dowsing you do, the more it heightens this intuition. You know automatically when you do it, you have a, an innate sense of whether you're going to find them or not. They say dowsing, but you become a water diviner. There are so many other things which would be detected by divining. We're trying to eliminate force lines, energy lines, energy centres, and come back to the water. I find the most valuable part is getting to the map, establishing the link between the animal's home or wherever we're starting from and establishing that link in my mind and letting the pendulum take me then. Archaeologists are not very um, pro-dowsing unless they've experienced it themselves. Around the country there are dowsers who are working with archaeology groups and with the National Trust and various organisations and they are getting their dowsing surveys validated. I have a friend who talked to me, well I was in a group at the time and talked to us all about remote viewing and I thought, my goodness me, that's what I do. I became interested in remote viewing um, after reading a book describing the work of the Stanford Research Institute 
and also the US Army uh, people who were looking at this as well. I knew somebody oh, several years ago who was a, an accountant and he lost all sorts of very important papers and I could see them and I could see where they were. But that to me is a form of dousing because it's a form of being aware of something in a different sort of way. During the Cold War, Joe McMoneagle in the US Army, he was given a task by the US Navy to go and look at a very large shed which was near the Barents Sea and, and see what was inside it. And he went and had a look at it and, and came out and said it was a, it was a massive submarine which had got some uh, tubes for the missiles, missile tubes, and it was being made and all that. And they said, well, we don't believe this because, I mean, this thing is about half a mile from the sea. He then went back it, every week for about th a couple of months and he saw that they dig, dug out a channel from this place down to the sea and he told them when it was going to be done and they put a spy satellite, a KH-9 spy satellite above the place and they actually saw the thing being brought out and actually being put into the, into, into the water. A dowser friend and myself were invited to dowse at Waden Hill. The site bounded the West Kennet Avenue, uh, at the bottom of the hill, and at the top of the hill there were some existing Bronze Age barrows. Uh, we found on the middle of the slope uh, several burials, about 15, 20 burials, and I also found a fairly straight feature, and the equipment, we were told, had broken down, so we couldn't see the geophysical results of where we doused. But a month later, I went to give this talk in, in Wiltshire to the archaeology group there, and this uh, chap came up to me and said, Eureka, you know, we found some very interesting things on uh, when we married your results with our geophysics. And lo and behold, in the area where we'd found these burials, there was the mark of a, of a round Bronze Age ring barrow. And where I had found this rectangular feature, there also was some sort of anomaly. I would never ever guarantee 100% success on water divining. Always believed it's an art rather than a science. And as such, we are only human. We are liable to make mistakes. At the moment, success rate with divining for me has been eight out of 10. The pendulum just go, whizzes round for me. Um, and then I just, sometimes I have to stop it. Sometimes it drags down on the page. You have your yes and your no signs, which for a beginning, to douse is all you need. Um, whereas you get more into dowsing, you do get a danger sign and you can get a sign that says, no, I can't work with this person. It can be the danger sign. Or there's another sign which says, uh, you don't do this work. And sometimes you get silly answers and you think, I'm not meant to be doing this. A suitable site to me would be one that has at least three to five courses which cross. If you drill on any one given source of water, you're limiting yourself. So if we can find multiple sources of water, and then we can find where they all cross over and drill, hopefully we'll find more water. When I first got into this work, I did have a sort of crisis about, oh gosh, I'm being paid to do this job. It seems such a bizarre way of doing it from a, a conventional method where they do these blood tests and stuff and that this crystal pendulum could give me the answers. But the more I get into it and the more results I see, the more I trusted it. And once I trusted it, that was, there's no problem. I, I, I'm comfortable with it now. And I, I think every dowser that does this type of work has to get over this um, trust thing. With the stick for me, with, with what I use, it generally speaking reacts quite um, dramatically. Other people will only get just a slight twitch or whatever. It really doesn't matter as far as that's concerned, as far as the individual. You must be able to interpret whatever you feel or whichever way it works for you. Now, I've run courses and I've probably had about 250 to 300 students through my courses. When the group come in, I ask them to find a total stranger as a partner. Then I take them through a procedure where I quieten them down by taking them to a place like Sour Head or somewhere like that and then up some steps to the edge of a wood and then I say on the, in the distance you can see some buildings and a town and the house of the person opposite you, the dwelling, is there and would you go there? And I've had funny things like, for instance, there may be some parts of the house are at different times than others. I did one where a woman went in and she came to the door and the door opened out into her face rather than inwards 
Afterwards, the person that lived there said, yes, it used to be like that, but we've rehung the door, so it's properly. She then went into various things, various rooms, and um, she went into one room, and it was back in the 18th century, and the, uh, there was a woman who was in there was dying. And, and he was confirmed that these were the rooms, the actual rooms that the person was, li the man was living in. When you've got a picture, and you see what you're looking for, and you say, well, that's no help because I don't know where it is. So you bring that picture closer and then you, you focus on, on something within that picture and you might look for a street name, you might name the name of a pub or you, you might notice the lie of the land or whatever it is, but you bring the picture closer. When I do the dowsing, I always protect myself, which is important. So I put myself, if you like, in a pink bubble. So I'm not picking up people's negative energies um, and problems because you can take on board people's psychological problems, that type of thing, if you don't protect yourself. So that's an important part. When you're working with other people. Go out with your rods, ask very clear, precise questions so that you can tune in exactly to the period that you're looking for or the, the, the particular thing you want to have an answer for. And you just have that uh, question in your mind, like on the, the back burner, as it were, and you go out and you accept whatever your rods tell you, um, and that's it. It's, you know, it's simple, but it is quite tricky to have a clear mind and a very focused mind. When I'm really into uh, a severe dowsing situation, let's call it, that there's a certain area of my brain which is working. I don't think I'm in control of it. I think perhaps I've learned how to switch it on. I get the answers to things and I'm thinking, why, do, why am I thinking about that? You just know, but I don't know how I know, <laughs> which sounds a bit, um, a bit odd. I think it's something to do with um, being able to put yourself to one side, which is what is common to all dowsing, surely. I, I really don't know where the answers come from. It's the universe, it can be God, it can be anything that you are calling on. You see the world in a slightly different way. There's somebody up there helps us. It's always interesting, it's always varied. It's not me. You could never get bored as a dowser. All of this, essentially, are yogic techniques. And it's a, 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 a question, one of my big questions in my mind is why science has not looked at, or psychology, has not actually looked at techniques that yogi, uh, yogins have been using for thousands of years. And all of these techniques that we're talking about, dowsing, remote viewing, and all these things are techniques developed by yogas. My specialization is in earth energy. I think the simplest possible way to talk about earth energy is to say that it's the earth's nervous system. And to understand that, you've got to understand that the earth is a dynamic, changing, living, pulsing being. And it's, it's got every right to have a nervous system as, as we have. Every person has little subtle energy bodies around us, the biomagnetic fields. This is a, a, a geomagnetic field, if you like, which interacts with our biomagnetic fields and has profound effects on our physical being. It's infinitely complex. It's four dimensional, it could be six dimensional, we don't know. And many people pick up parts of this thing, which are certain kinds of grid on the earth. I pick up energy lines, which are part of its whole system. And they, they are dynamic. Where they curve and where they cross are very special places, very sacred places. Many of them are ancient sacred sites. The sacred sites, of course, were recognized by, by the old people, the Neolithic people. And uh, they were open, much more open to the subtle energies of the earth. And when they, when they, they were nomadic and when they walked around they would find a place where they, they, they felt good and as soon as they stayed there they started to commune with the cosmos and that's their, their form of prayer. Their consciousness affected the earth and the earth responded and they could feel the response and we underestimate their knowledge and their, their, their ability to relate to the cosmos and the movements of the sun and the moon and the stars and, and things like that and they weren't diverted by all the things that, that we are diverted by. We really ought to know more about it because it has such a powerful effect on, on everything we do. The thing about dowsing that's not really understood is that everybody thinks it's, it's that dowsers can douse for everything. And in fact, this is true to a certain extent, but it's like saying everybody can play the piano, and, and that's true to a certain extent. But dowsers, like surgeons, like all sorts of different people, specialize in different subjects. And in fact, recently, I, I, I uh, wanted to find some water on my, my land. And although I've been dozing for 26 years, I got a specialist water dowser in because they are the people who really know 
how to do it. For this site, I think the yield would be around about somewhere between 150 and 200 gallons an hour. It's more water than any domestic supply would do. It would, it would run quite a lot of farm supplies. And then I got on to Aaron Bray, who has the drilling rig, the compressors, and all, all you need to put whacking great holes in the ground. We always douse the supply before we drill it. Geological surveys can only tell you so much. By water dowsing, you get a good choice. Some people believe you can drill anywhere and they tell you that water on their land is not always the case. Um, you know, the odd thing, geology affects things sometimes. There's different factors that can affect things. Most of the time, you know, we're probably about 93% successful with, with dowsing. When the guys were put, put the, the first drill down, Ralph said it would be about 120 feet. Well, they started to get it about 110, and that is not bad. <laughs> it's not far out at all. So uh, I'm absolutely delighted. This is a really practical demonstration that dowsing works. This water is 125 feet down. How else can you know that there is water there? apart from by dowsing. You've got to be very open to these things and not um, block, block anything. Just let the feelings and everything flow. You can feel that pull and it does it despite you and that is a lovely thing when people realise it's not up to them. It's like opening a door and you look in and you think, oh, I don't know whether I want to go there. So you close the door again. And when you're ready, you'll open that door more and more and more. And you realise there's so much to learn. Once people start it, I think it catches hold of them and becomes very important. And it's fascinating. It's very exciting. It is a built-in human capability. And a privilege to do it. When we were doing the line, I got to the feeling within me when we were coming to the mail line, because I concentrated on that. Before we went to Ireland, I sat out on Gurnard's Head where it comes in, and I sat there for ages with my shoes off on the rock that we knew that energy came in, and I got a kind of like a hum, like a sound, which went through my body, and I thought, wow. And so then when we went to Ireland, I would visualise myself in that situation, sitting on that rock with my eyes closed, and I would get that feeling and I would hold it. What we do when we, when we concentrate on something now is that we look at it and we see its colour and its texture, and we feel it, and we smell it, and we listen to it, because sometimes you can actually pick something up. And you can taste it if you like. Now hold it in your hand for a while and use all of these senses to get to know it as well as you possibly can. And now I'd like you to close your eyes. Hold it in both your hands there and close your eyes. And now I want you to become the bulb and go inside it and be its shape and go forward in time. You're in a, in a place of total rest and it's black and you're quite happy where you are because inside you, you have an awareness of a huge potential and it's not the right time and you're happy to sit and wait, still with this knowledge, exciting knowledge inside you, that at the right time, something very special is going to happen. And you become aware of 
slight variations of temperature. And that's faintly interesting. And then you become aware that the changes in temperature are getting greater and sometimes it's much warmer than others. And then the drumming sound comes. And when the drumming sound comes, sometime later, the, the black round you changes its texture a bit. So you, you get curious about this and you put a little probe out the bottom. And the little probe goes out and it touches a little goblet of water with nutrients in it and that you suck up inside the bulb there and you get that feeling that the thing has started. And the, the temperature gets warmer, the variations get, get more severe and you think I must find out a bit more about where I am and who I am and what potential I have. So you put out a little probe at the top and it goes up through the black and suddenly you break through with a little delicate white probe into a completely different environment. It's something very special. And your little probe, it's a very white probe, so you think, I must protect this thing because I've got to find, this, find out what's happening. And you put up some leaves and as soon as you get into this new environment, this air, you, your whole colour changes, you get green and you become aware of the elements, the wind, the rain, the light, the shade, the sun. And meantime, you're sucking up nutrients from the black earth. And you know that something, you know you're going to reach your huge potential and become something absolutely beautiful. And you form a little bud on the end of the probe. And you know that from this bulb you will reach your absolute fruition. And you become aware that you're not alone. There's hundreds of you all around, exactly the same. You just start communicating with each other. You burst into flower and you can feel the admiration from these other creatures and you realise that you really are incredibly beautiful. And you dance around for days and weeks. And then you reach a time when you think this cycle is over. I'll now retreat back, I'll preserve all my energy and I'll put it back in the bowl there because I know there's another cycle to come. Now we are at the moment in our five-sensed physical bodies, we are where this bulb is. We have the potential to develop into something which is quite extraordinarily greater than anything we can possibly conceive. We can be aware of, of an, a completely new environment, a completely new, new set of senses, a completely new understanding of our position in the universe. The thing is that the little bulb has all that knowledge inside it and it knows how to release it. We have all that knowledge inside of us and we're not sure how to release it. But we have to find a way. And maybe through the art of dowsing we can reach somewhere where we realise our true potential. Did anybody feel the rain and the wind and the bees and the flowers and things like that? The knowledge is all in there. Our potential to go into a completely different perception is within us. They have the advantage, they can do it. We've still got to learn. Hopefully we'll learn through dancing. I'm Patrick McManaway. I'm currently president for the Society, uh, which was started in 1933. And uh, here in 
the Royal Agricultural College at Cirencester, we're uh, celebrating our 75th anniversary year. I have been full-time uh, dowsing professional for 14 years. Uh, most of my work is directed towards uh, working with sick buildings and working with geopathic stress or, or compromises in the the, uh, the site energies, either as affecting uh, homes or businesses. The um, British Society of Dowsers has a number of, of roles and functions, um, at the, the heart of which is its uh, status and role as an educational charity, and to promote uh, the practice and knowledge of dowsing in every field and, and every form. So we, we have um, as broad a range of educational opportunities as we can, uh, both for people to dip in and experience it at an introductory level, but also to, to follow any, any particular path of interest, either to their own satisfactory level of depth or, or to professional standard if they choose. Very eclectic membership uh, with a broad range of interests, and we address that partly within the society by having four quite distinct special interest groups. Dowsing really is, is the individual's tool for uh, both finding uh, tangible things that are concealed uh, by their nature or, or by their location. The exact nature of the mechanism is uh, mysterious, many theories, but ultimately mysterious. The practical applications are so tangible and so valuable that it gets enormous use. People's agendas with dowsing are various. Uh, some people curious about what they can do and find with it. Some people more curious about how could this possibly work. All ages, all experiences and uh, we offer a comprehensive training program uh, starting with foundation programs for absolute beginners. The conference here uh, is an annual event and a lovely opportunity for membership to come together and share stories and experiences and we find a huge amount of, of learning simply by sharing. It's a wonderful opportunity for um, beginners and intermediate dowsers to uh, spend time either at workshop or, or, or simply in conversation with more experienced uh, practitioners and it's a time for us to celebrate and promote our art. Society at the moment is getting a lot of media attention. Dowsing is find, finding uses and applications in more and more uh, aspects of life and, and we expect that in a few more years we'll, we'll have very, very large, much larger events. We look forward to that. Dowsing uh, can change the way we perceive the world. The nature of our five primary senses is actually to exclude over 99.5% of the information around us, which is a good thing because informational overload is, is, is overwhelming. Uh, but when we realize that actually our tangible senses give us access to less than half percent of what we are um, in the midst of, then we start to become interested in other techniques to access information in other ways. So dowsing has a particular role um, within uh, both uh, tangible and non-tangible sense perception acts as a bridge often uh, between those two and whilst, um, whilst in the trance state one might be able to access uh, very widespread information um, if, if one wants uh, high, high degrees of, of clarity and distinction and precision then a, a binary system uh, ultimately serves that process. Its real advantage is that it's the most specific and it's the most concrete. And dowsing really is at one extreme end of that divinatory um, scale. It's the most limited of all. Um, it will only, it's a binary system, so it can only give you yes or no in an informational sense, or here it is, or here it isn't, in a locational sense. I think like, like all other dowsers, once, once the public knows that you're a dowser, they'll, they'll give you a call for, for things that come up. The missing cat, or uh, the missing wedding ring, or where's the well, could, could be almost anything. So it's nice, we get to wear, wear a number of hats and have a fairly broad and, and diverse job scope. Our membership has increased by 10% in the last year alone, so we're, we're very excited uh, that more people are, are coming to our doors and, and finding use and value from the things that we get up to. Come and welcome and give it a try. Um, wonderful, exciting journey to, to start on with uh, almost... Well, the uses and benefits of dowsing are really only limited by our imagination. Quite nice to get up here with like-minded people and get a chance to browse some yeah. radical books. Very good. Yeah, really yeah, exciting. Very interesting. We had some really good speakers earlier in the day as well. The talk on crop circles, the developments and findings in uh, 
quantum physics, spirit clearing, to energy lines, to earth acupuncture, to um, towers of power to helping crops grow and so forth. A lot of thought-provoking material to the extent that it kept me awake half the night. <laughs> the nice thing is, is, is all stands of people doing it. We have you know, advanced houses and everyone's always willing to teach and we're all started, we all start at the same level and it's just to be brave and have a go. Take a deep breath and do it and we can all do it. It's nothing magical or clever, we can all do it. It's just a dial of what information we have inside us anyway. So I think it'd be, you know, it's great fun and it's very stimulating because you have to shut out everything else that you're doing and just concentrate on that. Boom, join and come oh, to the conference. Enjoy. Good to be part of such a friendly group. There's so many areas of dowsing that they can be interested in. I really like getting the quarterly magazines and, um, and it's being able to share things with like-minded people which is very important because if you're out there on your own, you know, there's just so much you're missing really that you can share with other people and I think that's one of the main things that the, the group provides really. The talk title today is uh, Stone Age Survival and uh, I'm looking at various subjects relating to how the megalithic people lived and how they worked with subtle energies. I'm an earth energies researcher and I've been uh, studying crop circles and earth energies and sacred sites for about seven or eight years now and I've become very interested in the more pragmatic way that these energies could have been used by the ancients and there's been some new scientific research in the last few years uh, from America which is proving that the ancients did use these earth energies for very interesting purposes to do with agriculture, enhancing seeds, um, for changes in consciousness, uh, altered states of consciousness, and for several other purposes which we'll get into today. Uh, and I'm very interested, I kind of look at this from a geomancer's perspective, because I, I, I study dowsing and I work with geomancers, but I'm also very interested in archaeoastronomy, and, uh, and, the, and the mystery of how they moved these stones. Um, you know, the, you know what, was it stone levitation or was it just giants or was it very strong men? What was it? I think this kind of comes into play when you start looking at the subjects of these magnetic and telluric earth energies. I'm going to have a look at the basics of earth energies and the Michael and Mary line in particular because they sort of fascinate me. I think we're actually sandwiched by them on this land, aren't we? Uh, okay. Either side. Um, also look at ley, line, ley lines as well and see how they fit into the, the whole picture. Um, and we're going to look at orbs and how these are related to magnetism, like the little balls of light people often see. They're, they're very much related to crop circles, but they're also now related to um, uh, ancient sites as well. And lots of sightings have been seen of them. Uh, and then we're going to look at a brief look at megalithic acoustics, which follows on from Jake's and Carolyn's research, and geometry and how this can affect... Um, uh, the, the nature of earth energies and fertility. Uh, and we're going to look at the calendars and the way, specifically, the, the sort of point of this talk is the, the new science of earth energies and how they affect seeds and can enhance agriculture and uh, production um, and growth and fertility. Uh, and then I want to look at the Great Pyramid briefly because I've just been reading this um, rather thrilling book called The Giza Power Plant by Clive Dunn. And this kind of fits very closely in with my my research on earth energies and how the ancients could have harnessed natural energies from the earth, whether it be, could be many different types of energy, not just sort of ley line energies and things like that. And then look at the sort of nutritional aspects of uh, specifically rock dust and uh, microbes in the, in the soil, because I'm also studying nutrition, so kind of my two favourite subjects have sort of blended together, nutrition and big stones. Um, and really we're asking, you know, what were the ancients really doing back then? What was their way of life? And, uh, and, and, and I think it's very, very much related to this subtle energies that we kind of, we're getting back into nowadays, but it's often overlooked. We tend to look at stuff from our perspective, uh, our, our sort of modern perspective, without really going into the mind of how people used to live back then. Because when one thinks about it, you, mu you must remember that food wasn't readily available, you couldn't just go down the supermarket, you couldn't, you know, you had to find water that was clean or you had to clean it and you had to know where the water was and you had to base your societies or, or cultures around the, these kind of, with these things firmly in mind and I believe that's one of the main reasons these megalithic structures were built, it was for the production and promotion of fertility and it was to uh, make sure it would last through generations and this knowledge was preserved within the actual structures themselves. So this is the local site, which is um, 
just down the road from where I was brought up in Cherry Hinton in Cambridge, uh, called Wandleberry. This is Wormwood Hill we're looking at, uh, which also translates as the Dragon's Barrow. And um, this is just a sort of obscure little hill just along the road uh, from Wandleberry, a few hundred yards away really. And I've always been drawn to this place since I was a child. I've always kind of gone up this hill and spent time there, spent full moons up there, I think. And I found there's a very just strong energy up there. And, and, and I believe it's man-made, this sort of evidence that it is a man-made mound. And it's quite pyramidical in shape as well. And there's, um, this report was from the Andrew Collins book, The Circle Makers, where he describes how this guy, this Bill Eden, this UFO investigator, was studying uh, around Wandleberry. And he went up the hill and had all these um, effects, uh, like a headache and nausea. And, um, and he heard a sound as well, a deep tonal note. He had all, all these little points which you can read here. He could clearly see it, the hill, engulfed by swirling bands of lights. Unseen by his colleague, ignoring this, he stepped onto the mound amid the vibrant coloured light and instantly sustained the powerful headache and intense pressure on his chest and head. A bitter metallic taste, nausea and dizziness. With this came the sound of a deep tonal note that resonated from the ground and rose in pitch the higher he climbed. Even more curious was the disconcerting sensation that he was about to leave his physical body through the process known as astral projection. He also saw with his psychic eyes priestly figures in saffron coloured robes approaching the site in ceremonial fashion. So, um, quite an interesting experience for this particular guy. And, and I've heard um, other reports, I, I kind of did a bit of research a few years ago on Wanderbury and we found other reports very similar to this, uh, where people have had unusual sort of <coughs> kind of psychic and sort of interesting experiences. Um, but in this book, Andrew Collins, he relates the energy we're dealing with here, with orgone energy, which is what Wilhelm Reich was working with in the 50s, uh, with orgone accumulators. And there's many theories now that places like Silbury Hill and Earth Mounds all around the world are layers of organic and non-organic materials forming the actual mounds, which suggests it could have been used to generate and create energy naturally sort of from the earth and from the atmosphere. So this point I'll, I'll come back to later as we um, get further into the tour. <coughs> the other interesting thing about Wandleberry is um, that the, the Mary energy line goes through it, which has kind of become famous by um, a Hamish Miller and Paul Broadhurst book, The Son of a Serpent. This is a map of the entire alignment across southern Britain. Um, originally, the alignment was discovered by John Michel in the late 60s, um, and it was published in his book, The View Over Atlantis, where he found um, a correlation between uh, Glastonbury Tor and Borough Mump, which is like a mini Glastonbury Tor, um, near Glastonbury, about 12 miles away. And he noticed that it was a May Day sun uh, a Beltane Sunrise alignment, but also that it was a Samhain Sunset alignment. So he immediately assumed it was an archaeoastronomical alignment, which he kind of noted. But when he, he got inspired to draw a line across the entire length of southern England, he found that um, it was the longest part of southern England you could draw a line between. And also, it had many sites dedicated to St Michael on the, the alignment itself. And this has kind of become very important in sort of Earth Mysteries folklore. In the late 80s, Hamish Miller and Paul Broadhurst decided to go and see if they could douse this line and see if they could find any energy associated with it. Um, and they started in Cornwall. And they worked all the way up to Avebury and they found this sort of weaving energy line going around the main straight line alignment, which uh, are different things. When they got to Avebury, they discovered another one, a great big um, sort of female energy current, which they called the Mary Line. And when they, then they had to trace it back to Cornwall and then eventually did the whole um, southern part of the country. But they found that the energy line kind of weaved around the straight line alignment and met at certain places uh, where node points of energy existed and these were marked by many different sacred sites, stone circles, churches, etc. It seems to be Avebury is the kind of key to this, you know, we'll, we'll get into why later, but it seems to be that Avebury kind of either is the source of this energy where it comes either up from the earth or from the cosmos, or both, and it seems to play with the energies and kind of generate a certain frequency across the, through the lines, it's kind of in the centre of the alignment. Um, so the Mary line, which is on this sort of famous alignment, goes through Wandlebury, right through the centre of Wandlebury Ring, which is a great big circular earthwork. And uh, this, this kind of really inspired me, you know, to get into the whole Earth Mysteries movement when I read The Son of the Serpent. And it really opened up the whole door of history and it gave me an insight into what the ancients were thinking. This was, you know, several years ago now. And I'm still kind of working on this Earth energies, trying to understand this whole idea of Earth energies. 
He also, Hamish Miller also found that if you continue the line past Hopton uh, on the Norfolk coast, he found it continued, they both continued in uh, St. Petersburg in Russia. And when you look at this, I mean, when I first kind of noticed this, this image, I immediately <coughs> assumed it was a global energy current. It wasn't just one, it wasn't just a line in England. It kind of seemed like it was, there was more to it than this. And it took me, it took me a few years to find any more evidence of this until I came across um, the work of um, Robert Kuhn, who came up with this map. Um, and Robert Kuhn was a Glastonbury visionary. He lived there about 20 years ago, 15 years ago. And he was aware of the work of Hamish Miller and Paul Broadhurst. And he came up with this map, he kind of had a vision that the Earth had chakra points all around the world. Caroline kind of described this in, in, de in more detail yesterday. But these, this shows you where the main energy lines go. Um, this one here, that's the one that is the sort of global version of the Michael and Mary line that continues all the way around the planet. And the other line is what Robert Kuhn called the plume serpent, which is um, a more male, he called it the male great dragon as well. And you can see that it goes through Lake Titicaca and they meet there. And, uh, and I recently went to Lake Titicaca to see if I could find these energy lines meeting. And I got some very interesting results. Um, very interesting results because I wasn't sure if this was for real because um, I know Robert Kuhn and no one else has really been out around the world dowsing these lines to see if there's anything uh, there like Hamish Miller and Paul Broadhurst did in Britain. So I went there just recently, just got back a little while ago, and uh, found that the lines are there very clearly. You know, uh, the Michael and Mary lines are very clearly on the north and south part of the island. Well, this is the site on the north of the island, um, which is the Island of the Sun, or the Island of Sol, in Lake Titicaca, it's, sort of in, it's kind of in between Bolivia and Peru. And this is what the Michael line goes through, this big square block of stone, which is supported by four other blocks. And, uh, and it kind of goes through the flat surface, as you can see, and continues out, out to sea. And it's, they've obviously put these other stones around it. But I don't know if they, it, was, it had the four blocks supporting it originally, or whether that was actually uh, added later. I couldn't find any information on that. Interestingly, I went to another um, very amazing megalithic site called Sache Waman in uh, Peru, uh, north of Cusco and found an identical stone, virtually the same size, had the same marking on top, a little dimple in the middle, and um, just found that quite interesting, so I sort of wanted to show you that, there seemed to be a correlation between uh, many of the sites in Peru and Bolivia, and even on Lake Titicaca, because it's generally thought that Lake Titicaca is all Inca, it's all Inca sort of um, construction, all the sites within it, but it seems that they, this could have been a pre-Incan pre site with um, evidence by the megalithic um, stones that we can see. Also, behind that stone we just looked at is this great effigy, which uh, I don't know if you can tell, it's a big frog. Um, it's kind of got a frog's face with an eye and a sort of big chin and arms. And this, is, this was revered by the Incas and, the, and, and other societies around Lake Titicaca, a very sacred place. And Michael Lone goes directly through the middle of it. This shows you the path of where exactly where I'm standing on the line now, uh, of where it goes. It goes through the block into the great big um, frog effigy behind it and then out back into the lake. And the points on the block as well, the corners, are the four cardinal points, uh, north, south, east and west precisely as well. On the south part of the island, uh, we have the kind of, we have the Mary energy council, the female energy of the, of the same sort of system. As, um, as we've seen with the Michael and Mary lines, they kind of divide and, and go several miles apart across the whole landscape of southern Britain. And I found exactly the same thing happening in Lake Titicaca on the island of the Sun. This is the very south of the island. In the distance, you can see uh, the island, the island of the Moon, um, which the lines don't go through, incidentally. Uh, but there was a southern site here, and it had um, very it had a few megalithic blocks there, some interesting kind of, kind of just rough-looking carvings, and it went directly through this kind of gateway and out into the lake. And we can see the the movement of the lines on this map. And we can see the top of the island. Um, we've got the Michael line going across, sort of um, moving. Sort of southwest, south of the island of the Mary line, goes through two sites actually. It goes through the site I just showed you. It also goes through the, the Inca steps, which are kind of famous. That's where all the boats come into the island from uh, the mainland. People climb up and go onto the island from there. And um, it goes through both sites. And there's, all, there's lots of water, lots of uh, like little waterfalls and uh, springs all around the southern part of the island. There's the northern part of the island that doesn't have that. Just like mega little blocks and the big frog. 
Um, so through the middle of the island, you can see it kind of goes right through the center of it, is, is the plume serpent, is the, uh, is the other energy line that Robert Kuhn visioned out. I didn't actually, I couldn't actually find that very easily because I was um, slightly disoriented. I didn't have a, a proper map to work with while I was on the island. But I mapped out it afterwards and got, um, got it um, correlated with my geomancer friend, Sean Kerwin. And, uh, and it goes through the sort of uh, the part of the frog where the offerings were made. So where the frog was kind of the crossing point of these energies. <coughs> and that's a very sacred place on the island as well, which I, I, I found out later. And um, I'm just very intrigued by this because if, if this is for real, you know, if I did, if I did genuine, if I did a bit of good dowsing and found, you know, this there, then there's possibly these lines are a global a sort of um, entity that go all the way around the planet. So what, you know, what, what are we looking at here? Is it, what, who put this line here? Is it just natural? Is it kind of created? Is it manipulated for a certain reason? Um, a clue to me was the fact that there's, um, Hamish Miller once told me that the lines are hundreds of smaller lines of energy, all, to, all, all in one, recordable in one main energy line, which kind of stuck in my head. And I've been doing some research to try and find out more about this, to back this up. And that's when I started looking at um, the nature of the Earth's magnetic field and how that, how that, the lines of the magnetic field kind of break up into thousands of millions of lines all around the planet. Every day they kind of fluctuate and move about. They sort of blend into a field and become lines again, depending on the time of day. Um, there's many theories about what creates the magnetic field. Um, uh, big magnets in the earth, there's lava, um, the iron rich lava moving about creating magnetism. I'm not going to go into them theories today, I prefer just to kind of look at the effects uh, and, uh, and what we've discovered from it. You can see the chaotic nature of it. This is like a NASA image of what the field kind of looks like at certain times. And you can see it's completely chaotic, the energy's coming out from the South Pole and the North Pole. This is quite an interesting little crop circle that I came across which um, shows the nature of how magnetism works within a sphere, which is how it works generally. Because when you have two magnets at the end of a bit of paper and you put iron filings on it, they form into many different lines looking like this. And so you can see that naturally magnets, opposing magnets, poles, <coughs> they, they break, break up into hundreds of lines. It's not just a field as such. And, and this is what happens with the magnetic field every day, especially in the morning, is, is, is the important point. Because when the sun rises, let's say the sun rises over the horizon, as it rises, the magnetic field breaks up into all these what are called telluric lines. And, uh, and they charge across the landscape and they become, they become tighter and smaller but stronger. And this magnetism, as it, as it moves across the landscape, it creates a sort of weak DC current which becomes like electrical, so these electrical lines. It's kind of like the, the whole confusion of electromagnetism blending in and out of each other constantly across the face of the earth. And these energy lines are what I believe are classically earth energies, or what people are picking up as earth energies, combined obviously with other um, earthly and energetic factors, but fundamentally I think the, the main source of this energy is from the magnetic field. And this is what the Michael and Mary lines possibly could be, it could be hundreds of these lines that have been harnessed and controlled through magnetic rocks across the landscape and through all going kind of mounds and things like that. You can see the, how the sun kind of affects the magnetic field. It gets constantly hit by solar flares every day, obviously. And, uh, and this fluctuates the magnetic field, it moves the poles around, and it affects us because we, we, we're connected to it, you know, ultimately. Um, when the lines move across the landscape, they kind of move through everything. They go directly through houses, through us, uh, through sacred sites. Uh, they only go a few feet below the surface, interestingly. And um, you get many different effects depending on the geology that they move through. Uh, and this is where there's a change in geology. You often get a drop in the magnetic, uh, the magnetic energy of, of the field, of the, of the lines. And where this drops, the energy becomes more electric. And, and that, geologically, what the area is called, where the geology changes, is a conductivity discontinuity. And this is, um, Depends on, you know, because you're dealing with underground water, crystalline rock, all these different qualities of rock and geology, and this shifts and changes the lines as they move across. But where it drops, you can see in this image here, this is kind of um, been recorded of how telluric lines move around um, 
this particular kind of uh, stone chamber in North America. And, uh, and it seems to be that they knew where this would happen because of the geology, and they built a sacred site or an ancient megalithic site there for some reason. And so they, they obviously knew about this entity, whether they were dowsing for it, or whether they were intuiting it, or whether it was just pure, they just knew, you know, without thinking, they were connected so much. They, they placed the site there. But why, are they, why are they putting the sites at these places? Because this has been found all over the world. That where there's a conductivity discontinuity, this is what the name of the um, change of geology is, and you get a higher electrical charge because the magnetism drops in, in the lines. They were building many sites at these places. Now this is the work of um, John Burke and Catch Halberg in the book Seed of Knowledge, Stone of Plenty. They're part of the BLT research team uh, from America who were involved in uh, scientifically um, researching crop circles, which is another big interest of mine that kind of got me into this, this research. And it was through their research into the crop circles that they came, that they kind of found the evidence that this kind of energy they're dealing with was the same as in the ancient sacred sites. They found many instances where crop circles had been formed that the next year when they went back to look at the land, the crop where exactly where the circle was was growing better than it was around nearby, which suggested that something had happened to the crop, something had been stimulated or and, uh, and it had grown better, so it almost made it more fertile, made it stronger, made it grow better, and this really kind of triggered a lot of, it's triggered the train of research into other say, sacred sites around the planet, see if the same kind of thing was happening there. They also they did lots of experiments, they found that the, um, the crop circles were, had some electro, electromagnetic um, charge kind of put over, especially more electrical charge really, um, put over the crop, as though a sphere of light was, they kind of recorded it as though a sphere of light was rotating around the top of the crop field, and that's where the source of the energy came from. Uh, a Dutch researcher, L.J. Hasselhoff, did a scientific study of this um, and got it you know, into some proper scientific journals, Physiologia Plantarum, I think it was, and, uh, and until it's proved otherwise, it, this, this proves that these, these orbs or a certain type of electromagnetic ball of light creates crop circles. So this is kind of an interesting sort of um, foundation of where all this kind of research came from, you know, that it came from crop circles of all places. And whatever people think about crop circles, it's actually developed into this, this area of research and, uh, and, and how you can enhance seeds with this, with this knowledge. So this, this is just a, an image of the uh, planetary magnetic flow lines um, and just shows you the movement of it. It kind of looks kind of grid-like. Um, it's just a very basic image with the sort of uh, magnetic south and magnetic north poles. It just shows you that these, you know, these lines are being recorded around the world uh, by scientists, and that it's not just made up Earth energies kind of uh, you know, pseudoscience or anything. This is um, an electrical re resistivity map, uh, a Stonehenge. The lighter areas um, show where um, electrical current has constantly travelled through Stonehenge. Right? So they've obviously kind of these telluric lines are obviously moving through Stonehenge and other sites. They've recorded the white light show has been constantly moved through the, through the, uh, through the structure itself. Uh, the black thing there is the path, so just, just ignore that. And it kind of proves that the energies are going into these sites and they're being drawn into these sites um, for some reason. You know, people aren't exactly sure why. You can see how they kind of grip around the stones as well, the main stones <coughs> in the centre. This has been um, recorded at other sites as well. Now, as, as with Stonehenge and many other sites such as Wandleberry, such as Avebury, um, there's always, there seems to be a ditch or a henge around the edge, uh, which kind of, no one's really kind of got to grips of exactly what that is. Now whether that was a moat or whether it was uh, defences, this is what the archaeologists like to think. Um, that's generally what they say about Wandleberry, although it's obviously these sites are being sort of pushed back further in time by different types of data. But the interesting thing about these um, ditches is that, as I mentioned earlier, these telluric lines, as they move across the landscape, only go three feet below the surface, roughly. They don't go any deeper. This has been recorded by Burke and, and uh, the, the other researchers in America. So the ditches, what they do is, um, they stop the energy going through in a straight line, and uh, energy follows the path of least resistance. So as it hits the ditch, it'll go around the edge of it, 
and it'll keep going in here, just going round and round until it, it you know, creates some kind of uh, energy sort of field within it. And then the other interesting point along with this is that there's often uh, at these sites there's one kind of entrance into the site through the ditch where it's the same ground level. Just a small entrance normally. You get this uh, Avebury, there's a stone on the sites all around the world. And if the lines are if the lines are directed to go in into the site through this through this gap, if you like, through a gateway, then they go into that, then they hit the back the back ditch inside the circle and they start moving around within the circle as well. So you're getting this kind of uh, outside and inside energy kind of thing happening. And uh, it's a bit of, you know, people aren't sure exactly what it was for, you know, this, that and the other. But um, also, the, the, um, they often get directed right into the stones as well, when, they, when there's stones, megalithic stones involved. So they kind of grip the stones and move in and around the stones as well. Stonehenge, um, many years ago, the archaeologists discovered um, some small kind of um, sort of little bowls, like dips, cut into the earth, and, and they found ashes and, uh, and evidence of seeds and grains and something had been burnt there. Or they, weren't sure. they thought it was just offerings to start with, but when you start looking at Burke's research and all this, this from a different angle, you realise that well, they realised when they looked at this map, the points where these were put were exactly where there was most electrical charge from the drop in the magnetism of the telluric lines. So what we're looking at is they, they were always seem to focus on these points where the magnetism dropped because of the change of geology. Could be the stones were affecting it as well because obviously that comes from the Earth's geology. And um, it's that electrical charge seems to be the key to why they kept putting seeds and offerings in these certain places. Um, the same thing, you know, Avebury is very interesting as well. They did um, some research on this and found that all the stones there had a magnetic north. Um, you know, you know many, many, much, a lot of stone has a kind of, as it's formed, it points to the magnetic north pole when it's formed, and uh, and you can tell, you know, how old it is and when it was formed by that, because you can tell when different pole changes have happened, the pole shifts have happened. This is all from data from the bottom of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, where the lava comes up and forms and sort of spreads out, which pushes the continents apart, part, part of the continental drift theory. And over thousands and millions of years, you can see the sudden change in the magnetic norths of these stones, uh, of the stone on the bottom of the sea. So you can date when all the pole shifts have happened. And uh, so they, they knew, you know, people, you know, possibly the ancients knew about this. They knew that stone, when it was direct, you know, you could direct the north pole of stone, place it when you place it in sacred sites. In Avebury, all the stones in the circle, very big stones. All the magnetic norths all point, they all point to each other and kind of go around in a circle, every single stone in the whole structure does. Also the avenues, all the magnetic norths point into the centre of the circle. And, you know, so what were they doing? You know, what were they doing with this? Were they, were they trying to control the telluric lines? Trying to move it somehow using magnetism of the stone? I'm sure if you charge the stone you could kind of start controlling the energy a lot better. But, um, the other interesting point with Avebury, it's got a massive ditch, so obviously they were controlling the flow of the energy as well. Um, and they're two central stone, stone circles, which are almost the size of Stonehenge each, um, they're quite big. <coughs> um, <coughs> and the other point is that the Michael and Mary line are totally surrounding, going through exactly where, you know, it's almost like they're directing the Michael and Mary lines with the, with the magnetism direction of the magnetism of the rocks because they go down the avenues and they go into the circle in a certain way, they move about quite unusually. Now that could have been changed, you know, the, the whole movement of the Michael and Mary lines could have been altered because a lot of the stones have gone missing, you know, uh, well they've not gone missing, they've built a bloody village there, haven't they? Um, so I think we should all knock down, but I mean, anyway, um, so there's something going on, you know, with, with the Michael, this kind of brings the whole Michael and Mary line together with this whole scientific look at the telluric lines that have been discovered by Burke uh, and others. Um, and I think that, you know, from what Hamish Miller told me, with his hundreds of these lines form the Michael line and form the Mary line, perhaps these are telluric lines that we're talking about here that form naturally from the magnetic field. The Dowsers have always found that um, they fluctuate, uh, the Michael and Mary lines, in size and strength, depending on the time of day, different astronomical effects, the moon, etc. And um, so this could well have been happening at Avebury with these kind of energies. So I want to look at the kind of 
the light phenomena associated with these sites now. Um, obviously, when you look back in time, folklore and, and myths and legends, especially in Britain, all around the world, really, you find you know fairies, elf sprites talk about these kind of orbs of light that keep appearing, and there's um, certain you know speculations that you know where the ancients saw these lights because they seem to have been recorded throughout history they would build sites they would build sacred sites there some speculation says that you know they actually formed the crop circles the crop circles and the lights are always associated there's great videos about this and um, so where these lights were seen either crop circles could have been made and they built the sites there but how much crop are they growing at the time for them to have a crop circle, I don't know. Um, but you can see on some of these photos here, these are all from the book. Uh, I've got some other photos, I can't get off my camera unfortunately. Um, but they show you some, you know, like a, a plasma band there on the right, which they call a plasma band. The balls of light around this site in north of New York, and just generally all these balls of light here. Um, interesting point about this, it's always at dawn when this is happening, yet yeah, it's not any other time of day from their research, they found that it's only at dawn, around the kind of time, within a two hour period really, where these electrical kind of balls of light appear, or these orbs, no other time of the day. So they kind of, uh, and then they realise, when you look at the folklore of uh, Central America, North America, offerings are often made at dawn, of seeds and grains, at these sites. And uh, this is kind of all around the world. I think I'm gonna look into this a little bit further, see if I can find more evidence of this. Because if that's so, then, you know, it gives a whole other dimension to what offerings were because if they were putting the seeds there with this electrical charge it's now being sci they've now scientifically tested this that when you put seeds into these spaces where there's a, a change in the geology of conductivity, discontinuity and you, and you have the electrical charge particularly in the morning at dawn you put the seeds there for about an hour between 40 minutes and 90 minutes depending on what you need really. They could be quite old seeds, old grains, they could be stuff that you know, they, they tried to use, um, you know, types that were used in ancient times. They found that when they went and planted them, compared to controls, they found that they got a lot more yield. This is um, a dolmen, um, it's a 60 ton block of stone on four other, five other stones. Uh, archaeologists believe it was placed there by a glacier, just coincidentally on the fourth stone. Uh, it's moved thousands of miles, etc. But 60 tons, um, and they found that there was um, legends here, or myths and stories about offerings being made here. And some of the Native American tribes used this place to take their seeds and grains to. They travel hundreds of miles sometimes. Because cause they, what they found was is that the dolmen shape seemed to be the key kind of shape involved in, in this kind of you know Stone Age technology, if you like. Uh, they also found it wasn't just with dolmens, it was with um, mounds, you could, you, could, you, you, could, you could put seeds up on mounds and still get good results. So it seems to be like, why, why, were, they all used, why were they all making dolmens? Why were they using <coughs> roughly the same design? Uh, there's an idea that Edmund talks about, which they were kind of shelters from you know, uh, the commentary debris. But I think there was more to it than that. I think there was another aspect to it, that they were harnessing this energy these are these telluric lines of force to make sure their seeds would yield the next year. Then you've got the mounds as well. Um, but you've also got like any pyramidical structure that's got a flat top, they found the same kind of thing could the same effects could be uh, recorded. So this is actually some of the results that, that they found. Um, this one here is from uh, North American rock chamber. And it's blue corn, which has grown hundreds of possibly thousands of years in that area. Um, Placed it within the rock chamber in the morning for 75 minutes, and they found. Look, I mean, and, and compared to the controls which they planted, you can see how much they got. They got a threefold increase in yield just by doing that, which is something. It's quite something. The same thing happened. Uh, a similar thing happened at Takar on the Lost World Pyramid, not on the two main pyramids in the Central Plaza, which are the famous ones that are in the start of Return of the Jedi, I think but actually on an older one, which is much further away, much more sort of broken and more of a ruin. And because the ones, the central pyramids in the main plaza are much newer, they're like a few hundred years or up to 800 years newer than the Lost World Pyramid. But when they placed the seeds on the new, newer pyramids, they got no difference from the controls. When they placed the seeds on the Lost World Pyramid, which was much older, one of the first constructions at Takano, that's when they got the results. So we're looking at, you know, almost like a timeline of knowledge here. It's kind of the older knowledge seemed to, you know, the older sort of civilizations seemed to have the knowledge 
of this technology, which is like a, a fertility technology, if you like. And, um, and, and the, the seeds would often always grow faster, they would be stronger, so you, when they were stored, they would last longer throughout, you know, throughout the sort of winter and so forth, they wouldn't get destroyed. And, um, and this, this, this kept happening with all their research all around the world when they tested, they tested put seeds at Stonehenge, they put seeds all around in different countries. And then when they started looking into the traditions, that's when they found that the offer about, you know, they kind of did it, they followed the traditions of when the offerings were made. And it's also found that in North America, they, they found a general thing there, that the, um, the village or the, the community that had, had the earth mound, all the, all the little flat top sort of earthen pyramid, would be a, a more wealthy community than those that didn't have one. So what we're looking at here is an um, ancient kind of business. They were growing more food than they needed and then trading it with other people because they had the technology, they had the secrets of, of the, ancient, um, uh, the ancient food growers, the ancient farmers. And obviously a lot of this knowledge has been completely lost now. And, uh, and luckily the crop circles have given us it back, funnily enough, of all things, considering it's in crops. Um, so we're looking at this, you know, I'm looking at this on a kind of global scale. It seems like this, this knowledge was known about on a, on a global scale. And this, this kind of correlates with so many other things to do with the megalithic societies all around the world. Another thing which kind of, um, which kind of gets me is, is these, um, these spirals that I keep finding all over the world. Um, because I think that they're, they're a symbol of this energy. And where you find them um, is quite interesting because there are often chambers as well. And there's, uh, there's all these ones here, Newgrange and Love Crew, both in Ireland have them. And they're both chambers. Tarkshin, Bugaba, Hidakin, they're all chambers. Timonaku, I even found one. I couldn't believe it. I, I, didn't, I stupidly didn't take a photo of it because it was in the, in the museum. There. Um, but it looks very similar to the one on the right. It's like just two spirals, really intricately cut. Timonaku, it's really kind of... You know, this is Bolivia, this is, you know, so it really kind of intrigued me. And also, it was very near, you know, it's not that far from Lake Titicaca, so um, were they aware of the Michael and the Mary lights, or whatever they might have called them back then? Were they aware of these energies? And was this the symbol for this global understanding of either telluric energies and fertility, or just study nature of Earth energies? So it's a bit speculative, but I just wanted to bring that in. The middle stone there, this is one of the carved spheres that have been found all over sort of northern Scotland and some in Ireland and northern Europe, which um, they think that it was kind of they kind of they dated them sort of roughly to the Neolithic period, but it's hard because they were just scattered around this stone circles and different sites. But you can see the carvings on some of these are quite incredible as well, and the geometries of them are of the, the Platonic solids, you know, way before Plato. So we're looking at ancient polyhedra here, which are an understanding of spherical geometry. So there's all these different things to consider. When I was in Peru, I went to a place called um, Silistani. And uh, the other point with these, uh, this, the idea of working with energies for fertility, the rock chambers in Ireland, it's, it's quite, uh, sorry, the um, round towers of Ireland, they found that the same kind of results could be found there, that they were used for this purpose because they kind of drew in energy. Some believe because they're of the shape of the height of them, they draw in cosmic energy as well, and they would, they would go through the landscape, but this hasn't been properly investigated. You get these huge towers, megalithic blocks, huge blocks of stone, in a kind of um, just a cylinder which has got slightly wider at the top. Yeah, which is very unusual, you know, why they, why they do that. And inside it, inside the main megalithic blocks, they just have a little entrance as well. And inside it was a, a sort of conical structure, uh, originally, made of smaller stones kind of coned up at the top um, and they did find um, sort of skeletons in there but they think they were added much later. And there's, all, there's many of these towers are copied as well um, by the Incas much later on because I think this is a sort of megalithic period we're talking about here. You can see the difference in the stonework in Peru, you can see the megalithic period, the Neolithic period, it just looks completely different to the Inca. You can tell the Inca were inspired by it and they followed on this stonework tradition but it just, it's just the sheer magnitude the earlier constructions so much bigger than the later constructions of the Inca, and, uh, and there's a bit of a debate about this. A lot of the, the Inca kind of um, community don't want to admit that, but it's just something that a lot of different researchers are, I agree with. Uh, we've come across that in Peru and Bolivia, and so these these really small doors are always facing east as well over the lake, which is like next to Lake Titicaca. 
And this east is obviously where the sun rises and these energies would come from, that would go into these chambers. And uh, there's, all this, there's quite a change in geology there as well, because it's up on a ridge, and you can sort of see the ridge there. There's also a stone circle there as well, which is pretty much the only stone circle in South America that I've kind of come across. The ridge goes up here, so they couldn't have done anything over there, but they could have done all the east-facing alignments and sort of worked out like, a, like an agricultural calendar, which is what the, the tour guides believe it was for. There's two of them, there's actually a smaller one just next to it as well. There's all these little bits of evidence I'm kind of picking up, you know, focusing on this research from different parts of the world. It does seem that this kind of knowledge, there wasn't awareness of it. I mean, it's just an explanation for some of these sites, which um, often there isn't an explanation. Um, this is a little quote from uh, Paul Devereux's book, Place to Power. And uh, the ancient sites of power were sometimes found and sometimes deliberately constructed to mimic or enhance what could be found in nature, which I believe the energies we're talking about here. In either case, the forces of the natural world were used, and they were used for a variety of purposes, such as the promotion of fertility, which is what I believe these energies were involved with, and for healing as well, because these, these energies also have a healing effect. And we know about how crystals can have a healing effect, which is evident in much of the stone used. But the overriding purpose was the need to have gateways through which contact with the spirit could be achieved. In the ancient world, there were certain people who knew how to work with the physical world in order to create access to the spiritual. So this is the, the other aspect of these energies, which I want to have a quick look at, is the shamanic aspect. Because they found where these con conductivity discontinuities happen, in North America, for instance, many of them are at vision quest sites of the Native Americans. And this is where you, have, you, get, a sudden, you get quite a change in consciousness. And we saw the effects that that guy had at Wormwood Hill in, 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 uh, near Cambridge at Wandlebury all this nausea, this change in consciousness, dizziness, sort of going out of body. This is all associated with the kind of vision quest scenario. This is all the same kind of energy we're dealing with here. And um, this happens throughout North America. They've tested the geology at all these different sites and found that there is a conductivity discontinuity there. And, um, and it can have this effect. And they are very aware of this. So possibly they went to these places, just speculatively here, um, went to these places, had these psychological effects, these consciousness changes happening. They were possibly they felt that they were accessing the spirit realm, or maybe they were, and they used this to kind of enhance their spiritual practice, whatever they were doing. Perhaps that's why they, they and then they saw the orbs there, possibly, and then um, they built the sites there because of what they were dealing with, and, they, and then they started more, maybe looking at it more scientifically and wondering, you know, make offerings there. And actually, when they might have just made offerings there, and realized when they planted the seeds, they got four times as much as they did the year before. They're going to kind of, you know, so I'm just you know, trying to look at it from a, going into the mind of how it could have happened. Um, but really, you know, there's all these different aspects to it which are kind of, I'm finding, all cor seem to correlate more and more. And then we look at the nutritional side of it, you know, the kind of, you know, health side of, of you know, the ancients and what we're dealing with here. Now, obviously, stones, megalithic stones, they're, they're rock, yeah, obviously. Um, but, this rock is mineral rich. It's got all the minerals you can ever want in it. There's 70 odd minerals in it. And I've studied nutrition, so I know about minerals, and I've kind of looked quite deeply into this. I looked at the nature of it. I've come across this uh, product called rock dust, which is just sort of marketed as a um, nutritional product. But what it is, it's just basalt rock and then another type of um, rock, I can't remember which one, um, ground into dust, and then you sprinkle it. You kind of sprinkle it on your foot, your crops or your, your plants, your garden, and it helps stuff grow better. It seems to kind of uh, um, it improves the soil because it helps microorganisms, microorganisms come back into the soil. It enhances that. It remineralizes the soil, and therefore it remineralizes the plants. And therefore, remineralizes us, which is vital importance because, as we, as many of us know, we're into nutrition. The mineral deficiency issue is a massive one in a, in a supermarket food because um, modern agriculture only uses three minerals, uh, MP, the MPK sort of spray they put on it. We're missing out on the other 67 odd minerals and this is having a huge health effect on the population and suddenly, since I've started doing this, suddenly cancers increase and all these different diseases are increasing hugely. So there must be, there is a correlation there. And they found that through studying the effects of this rock dust, just, just by drinking it and adding it to food, you know, a bit of both, it re, because of the mineral content, it returns the hair colour 
uh, to its natural state. They found that in some people, not me yet. Reduced radioactive components in the body. This is because it's paramagnetic, it's positively magnetic. They found that that, ang that angle on it, it kind of creates this kind of a positive effect. You know, simple, simple as that. And um, soil improvement increases plant growth. So it holds off unwanted radio waves, microwaves, infrared radiation, light waves, ultraviolet, radiation, and gamma radiation. They found that with monatomic as well. They found that with monatomic minerals, a similar thing can happen if you put that in soil. Protects it from radiation. It can even negate the effects of it as well. This is what they're finding. Um, it affects the natural telluric currents and acts as acupuncture points on the earth, a bit like megaliths, to reduce toxic effects. What they found is, even with a small bag or a little, you know, handful of this stuff, if you just put it in the ground, a certain place, and put other ones around the garden or the, or the farm, it'll, it'll increase and organise the telluric currents, so they're moving around better. And this enhances the soil, this enhances the land, enhances fertility and the crops and the yield and the strength as well. This is what we've kind of been talking about. So it's not even like you need to put a load of big stones down in the garden, you can just put this stuff. Yeah, they found that when you wear bags of rock dust around the neck, they found that it helped protect from uh, computer radiation as well. So I'm quite intrigued by it because I feel quite sensitive to that kind of radiation. But for example, in, um, in Australia, they've done some tests with um, some with um, some stones, the same kind of basalt stone, and, um, and they planted it around farms in Australia. This was in um, Stone Age Farming by Alana Moore, great book. Uh, it's little stone circles, they're not aligned or anything, just five or six stones placed all around the farm. And within a year, within two seasons, the yield of the entire crop and the strength of the crop increased hugely. Just, just by putting it, they didn't do any other experiment, just put these small stone circles in. They seem to reorganise the energy, just like we're talking about here. So, so if that does that with little stone circles across in a farm, imagine what it does across the, on a planetary scale with all these megalithic structures everywhere, which are all very beautifully designed, they're geometric, they're harmonic, they're fractal, some people call it. They, they, they organise the energy well. And if, and if you put the minerals, the, the rock dust in, um, when you're or when you're getting the soil together, that's when um, it makes sure it helps it helps the microorganisms and the microorganisms help the minerals go get into the soil properly. So there's like this sort of synergistic effect. <coughs> so I'm very interested. I'm going to sort of when I get a place with a sort of decent garden, I'm going to start experimenting with this the little Stone Age kind of garden. <laughs> see what see what we come up with. You know, just start from scratch and see if we can get any results. Let's build a little dolmen, put the seeds in it. So we're going to kind of look into this a bit more, and I think it's kind of um, when you look at the um, the way that food is produced nowadays. I mean, if, for example, suddenly we couldn't get any food from the supermarkets, I'm not saying a disaster or anything like that, but there probably will be one. Um, and we can't get any food from the supermarkets. The taps stop running. We can't get the water. You know, what are we going to do? Where are we going to? We we need kind of knowledge. You know, this kind of knowledge. We need to know how to grow food, we need to know where to get our water from, uh, we need to know how to get the right nutrients to make sure our food grows properly, we need to make sure our seeds, grains, whatever, are strong enough to deal with anything that's coming. And I think this is a kind of the mindset of the ancients, this is how they were working. I think they were dowsers, I think they were geomancers, you know, when you look at, you start looking at the different aspects. They had to know where their water was, so dowsing's a good one for that. They might have just sensed it, there might have been more springs around then, I don't know. Um, but also, um, they had to know um, what foods they could eat. You know, if they're searching for wild food, more hunter-gatherer style, then you're going to have to kind of know what foods you can eat, which aren't going to kill you, which aren't going to poison you. So again, dowsing comes into that. And I've looked into this. You can douse for what's safe to eat for you. So, and you can douse for what types of rock to use to make sure the plant grows. What type of rock dust to use to make sure the plant grows properly sort of soil you need for that particular plant. You can douse for all this stuff. You don't need necessarily to have a ton of knowledge about it. You know what I mean? You can actually douse this. It's an intriguing study, the whole dowsing thing. A lot of it is dismissed by academics and archaeologists, etc. <coughs> but just, just yourself, if you do it, you get results and you can find things that are, are, are very, very interesting. So this just shows you some of the major faulting in Britain, which is, I find quite interesting because um, a lot of the um, sort of famous earth energies and ley lines are associated with this. Many of the ancient sites are on these lines as well. Um, and this is kind of um, one of the keys, I think, to understanding the nature and creation and 
structure of earth images. And this is another image which um, shows you the, the dots show you earth, earthquake epicenters of Britain. And uh, all the squares of the nearest towns. And then they've got the lines of earthquakes which seem to, this is from David Cowan's work actually. Um, and then you've got the Michael line as well. And it kind of just starts looking a bit like a kind of grid, doesn't it? And, uh, quite neatly correlates with the kind of earth grid over Britain as well, which we'll have a look at a bit later. But it's just these fault lines are kind of intrigued me. I've not really done much research on it yet, apart from looking at Paul Devereux's work on the earth lights and how they seem to be related. There seems to be a relation between the movement of rock under the earth, the piezoelectrical effect. And the, the orbs of light that are often seen, so it kind of goes, you know, with the, the other thing. This book here, absolutely mind blowing. The Giza power plant. Um, kind of, I've been looking at just looking at other technologies of the ancients, and I thought Giza pyramid was probably one of the things you should look at pretty swiftly. And uh, I've just whipped through that in the last few days, so I'm just presenting just some bits and bobs I picked up from it, which kind of fit with this theory. Is that the ancients had a very high understanding, very very good understanding of how to get energy from the earth and use it for electricity and different energies, you know, for, uh, radioactive energies. Um, the, metrology, the metrology of the pyramid, uh, the measure of it, the size and design of it, is a precise harmonic of the earth's measurements, um, suggesting the pyramid could harness the energy of the earth through resonance. So what he's saying in this book, because um, Clive Dunn, the author who's uh, 35 years, has been an engineer, so he kind of looked into it from an engineering perspective, believes that these energies here, which are all within the Earth, uh, mechanical, thermal, electrical, magnetic, nuclear and chemical, could all be, all that could be somehow harnessed through the pyramid. And he thinks all the, the inner design of it is completely and utterly designed as an energy generator, not just for Egypt possibly, possibly for the, planet the way that Tesla was looking at things many years ago, uh, 90 years ago. <coughs> and I'm just summarising some of um, what he discovered, which he thinks different parts of the pyramids were used for, or the pyramid, I should say. Um, he actually thinks the other pyramids were just like um, motors to help get it going, to help get the actual energy going. So what you need to do first is mechanically couple the pyramid with the earth, so you need to kind of get them in harmony with each other. And you initiate oscillation to prime the stone in the pyramid. You have to start moving it slightly to kind of uh, trigger the 55% um, quartz granite we're looking at, which kind of is the piezoelectrical effect. And it, then it would vibrate in sympathy with the earth. Um, so remember the swaying bridge from Tesla did this, you know, in, in experiments he did. He got, he, he got, he believed he could knock over, I think, the Empire State Building with five pounds of pressure if you get the right, get the right sound and acoustics within it. Uh, so yeah, the granite, the 50, which is um, mainly the king's chamber, I think, acts as a transducer by alternating the compression, like you know, compression up and down on it, and kind of you have to get that alternating slowly. And then this queen's chamber, he thinks, was a hydrogen chamber, which fueled the power plant and enabled the energy to be transferred to the outside. What he found was one of the general things about the pyramid is that if his theory is correct, which is very strong theory, but it seems to absorb. You know, if, if it works, if it's in resonance with the Earth, it would absorb seismic activity, so thereby reducing earthquakes possibly across the whole planet. We must remember that the pyramid, the Giza Plateau, is, is right in the centre of the world's landmass as well, the surface of the Earth. So, you know, did they choose it deliberately? Because that's how they could harness, either, either harness the most energy from the most of the Earth and get into it easier and to affect and reduce the earthquake thing as well. And not possibly, if they, if they were smart, they could have got the energy from the pyramid outwards across the landmass of the planet to all the different countries, but again, this is speculative. But it seems that they could produce electricity from it, and there is other evidence that they did have massive... You know, you've seen the images of the guys with massive light bulbs. And the whole pyramid thing really just intrigues me, because uh, there's something about that. I think this could have been the fundamental kind of source where this, a lot of this knowledge kind of came from, the fertility knowledge throughout, throughout the world. I think they were using the same, they were working to the same principles all around the world coming from this kind of knowledge. Move swiftly to Florida. This is Edward Liskownen, and uh, he built a megalithic village. Uh, 1,100 tons of rock he moved alone with no electrical tools, with no power tools, um, from coral, local coral. Um, he was about five foot tall from Latvia, 
and uh, he was born. In, he was born on August the tenth, eighteen eighty-seven. When he was twenty-six years old, he was engaged to his true love, Agnes Scuffs. Agnes was ten years younger than him, and he affectionately called her Sweet Sixteen. Uh, but she cancelled the wedding the day before the wedding, and uh, he went into a deep depression and decided to build a monument to his lost love. He just went to work for like twenty-eight years, I think, building this huge. Um, megalithic village and some of the rocks were just um, 60 tons I think and he worked alone no one ever helped him there's all these stories about him levitating rocks he had a good understanding of magnetics apparently Clive Dunn the, the author of Giza Power Plant looked into this quite thoroughly from an engineering perspective and these are the tools that were left by Edward Liscalvo and um, he seems to have a rotating um, magnetic engine flywheel here which was a which would he would generate energy from itself by using magnets to spin it. And also there's evidence that he was using the telluric lines because he had a little gate he used to open, which used to show off. And, and if you stand there, in front of the gate was closed, you just feel normal. When you open the gate and you stand there, you feel charged up with energy. And it was one of these telluric lines that he controlled and moved through the area. Or it was very magnetic, he said at the time. This just shows you some of the, um, this is a 28 tonne obelisk which he put there himself, cut it, dressed it, moved it, did it all himself, no help. There's a story that he moved, um, he, a, a truck driver turned up with a sort of 20 tonne piece of coral on the back and uh, he told the truck driver to go off and get a cup of tea or something. And uh, when the truck driver got back five minutes later, the block was standing upright off the truck with no idea how he moved it. And it was only Edward Liscount standing there. There's evidence that there's suggestions that he was using sound to move the stone as well, to like charge up the stone. Um, but I just wanted to look at this from a kind of a, you know, it's like a modern perspective. It's the 1950s he was doing this, not 1940s, 50s, and 60s, I think. And he, he created one of the most incredible temples on the planet, really. He was doing it recently, he was creating these megalithic structures. Because the other aspect, which I'm very interested in, which I think most of us are, is how you move these blocks, how you cut them, what were they doing, how was he doing it? So, and he went to his grave saying he, he had the secret of the Egyptian pyramid builders. He, he cracked it, you know, and, uh, but he never shared exactly how he did it, unfortunately. So we're planning a bit of a field trip there next year if anyone wants to come. Um, we're going to go and check it out, see if we can get any clues from there. And I think because he was working with the magnetic energy, I think somehow he'd clocked on as an engineer to what Clive Dunn's been talking about, he was able to harness a similar type of energy, which is related to um, the Earth energies again. This is the, the nine ton gate, which um, you could push around with your finger, a child could do it, push, push it open with your finger, it would revolve. It fell off once uh, after just wear and tear, and they had to get a team of uh, engineers in for consultation, 50 ton crane. And, uh, and they couldn't get it back exactly how it was. Um, and he, somehow he did it all on his own. He had a, a drill right through the middle, perfect uh, cylinder drill right through the middle. And he had a truck bearing, which he balanced it on. And no, one, no one has a clue how he did it on his own. Talking about magnetics still, I mean at Tiwanaku, um, there's, um, this is the Akapana pyramid. And on top of the pyramid, it's very, it's very flat, it's, it's rough now, there's not much left of it. There's a sort of... Um, Gateway here, be like the gateway of the sun, which is falling over. But in the distance, there you can see these two stones. Actually, they're two lines of stones, seven stones each on either side. When you go in there, the compass goes crazy. It just spins around. It's a huge magnetic field they put. They come out somehow harnessed there. And what were they using that for? You know, what were they using? You know, what were they doing in Tiwanaku way back then? They were creating a magnetic field. So I just wanted to just point out a few anomalies around the world about this, this nature of this magnetism we're dealing with. These are some stone spheres that were discovered at Lough Crew in Ireland. Uh, the one on the left is iron stone, which is um, negatively charged magnetic. And on the right is uh, granite, which is uh, positively magnetic or paramagnetic. And these were found at Lough Crew and um, hand held, you know, hand size, you could hold them. What were they used for? What was going on? Perfect spheres as well, really cut precisely into perfect spheres. Was it to enhance the mag? Was it to enhance or reduce the magnetic energy currents, and you know, do something with it from an agricultural perspective or from a psychological perspective? What were they doing with these? I'm, I'm actually asking a question here. I'm not going to 
answer that. So these are some other spheres. These ones are carved into intricate geometries. And apparently they're still in the Ashmolean Museum. These were photographed by Keith Critzlow 20 odd years ago. Um, they're found near megalithic structures around Scotland. Um, the other ones, some were in Northern, some are Ireland. There was a few, I think, in nor Northern Europe as well, but I think mainly Scotland. Uh, some say they were definitely, some researchers and archaeologists think they were hunting projectiles because it had, uh, you can see, you can see the shape of them. They could have had leather thongs around them or something, but I'm not too sure about that. Some of them were different types of rock. That one's granite on the end, you can see that. Uh, but they show the different geometries, the different platonic solids, which I find very interesting from an earth grid perspective because what were they doing with them? You know, were they using them for teaching, sort of college type situation? Um, well, they, that some of them were, they haven't been tested for magnetism yet, so I think they might have been used like the ones from Luff Crew we used to enhance the telluric energies, to change the telluric energies, the magnetic energies. Keith Critchlow, master geometer, he um, concluded through rigorous research that they were for the study, comparison, and analysis of spherically sy determined systems of geometry, which would make sense because they're kind of uh, ancient versions of the Platonic solids. It shows you the um, Spirals as well on this one. This is like this beautifully carved. It shows you the triple spiral, double spiral, which I kind of think is related to this earth energy that we're talking about. This is the dodecahedron. This one's interesting because it's um, an octahedron and a cube combined. Um, if you look at it, you know, you can imagine it. It's got the points of cube and points of uh, octahedron, like double ended pyramid. This one's the octahedron, just on its own. Critzlow's drawn that up. This is an icosahedron and a dodecahedron combination, which he, for some reason, I don't, think he t I don't know why he didn't take the photograph of it, but it shows the combination, which is very interesting because this is the fundamental um, basis of any kind of earth grid research. It's the kind of a uh, sort of perfect geometry, really. And um, you can see that within this image. This is what he kind of finished up with in his, in his analysis. And he found that when you combine them all, you get this kind of, uh, this kind of, Geometry here showing the different, showing the sides of the icosahedron, the triangle, and the uh, uh, dodecahedron as well. And then when you look at the Earth grid, it shows, the, shows exactly the same fundamental um, design. This is a slightly better version of it. This is a flattened version of the Earth grid developed by uh, William Becker and Beth Hargens. Um, they kind of did, uh, added the icosahedron, dodecahedron together, but then kind of blended it with some of Buckminster Fuller's um, research as well. This is what we looked at earlier. This is um, the earthquake epicenter and, and, and the lines associated with it, and that is the British version of the grid. So you can see the kind of correlations. That I find it quite quite intriguing, personally. There seems to be these correlations in Britain. I haven't found it in any other countries. Lucky. This is just, you actually get this program on Google Earth now. If you've got Google Earth on your computer, you can just type in Becker Hagen's grid in Google and you can download this program from their website and just place it over Google Earth and play with it. It's really good. You can see the green line here and you can see the multicolored line here. So, so I just wanted to point out these two lines because um, the multicolored one is the Michael and Mary line or the Michael, St. Michael alignment. You can see how closely it fits with this idea of the earth grid, which, uh, which Becker and Harkins did not even know about when they designed it. They had no idea. I don't think, it was, I think they were doing it before um, they became aware of it. I'm quite intrigued by this. I, actually, I got in touch with Beth Harkins recently and kind of pointed this out to her. And several other people have pointed it out as well. And she's, she doesn't know what to do about it. <laughs> she, just, she just thinks it's either a brilliant coincidence or it's it's part of it, it's part of this understanding, this ancient understanding of the earth from a metrology perspective, which John Neal's going to talk about, because obviously they had an understanding of the measurements of the earth, otherwise how could they design the Great Pyramid so precisely? Um, they had an understanding of these energies moving across the earth, and they, they harnessed it apparently with the, Michael, the global rainbow serpent on Michael and Mary line, and um, this could be evidence of the ancient power system of the planet as well. Um, very speculative, I'm not going to sort of go into that now, but there are ideas about that, that this um, the grid could be linked with that 
which was developed from the Great Pyramid. This just shows you the European version. This is the this is the kind of the Google Earth thing you play with. It kind of shows you all the different the different colours show all the different geometries, the different platonic solids, some great earth circles. This is this is an organisation I'm involved with, Avalon Rising. We just made an interesting discovery. Um, well, it wasn't a discovery, it was actually a construction project. Um, we made a stone circle at the Big Green Gathering Festival we were involved with, the Earth Energies Field, funnily enough. And um, me and Sean Kerwin did that. A year later, we built a wood henge at the Sunrise Celebration site. Well, actually, Sean did that. And I just helped him a little bit. And then, a year later, we decided to just get on Google Earth and draw a line between them. And um, just coincidentally, if there is such a thing, we went directly through the tower of Glastonbury Tor, which we were quite pleased about, considering we hadn't surveyed anything. But it just showed that, that showed me something about the nature of how the ancients were, were functioning. They had an intuitive aspect to them, which was much, which goes beyond kind of surveying, it goes beyond kind of trying to measure things and work things out. I think there's a deeper understanding of, um, you know, intricate, we follow geometry, we follow kind of these natural fractal golden section patterns within ourselves, within nature. And I think the design of these sites was influenced by that, and I think the intuitive side of the ancient mind was much more awake and aware than we are, because we're so bombarded with nonsense nowadays. And I think this is kind of key to understanding the ancient the megalithic mindset. And um, it's also, you know, it proves to us that we're connected, you know, that we can do this kind of stuff. We're not disconnected, we're not, we don't have to rely on the government to make all our choices for us, we can do what we want. And I think this is why we need to get back to these old ways of growing our own food, learning skills, <coughs> understanding the earth energies, all becoming geomancers, all of us. Dowsing, everyone should know how to douse for water, full stop. You know, we should all learn that. And, um, and how to test for wild foods to see what we can eat and what we can't eat and, and all this kind of thing. So I think this is all really important knowledge that is linking up with this megalithic knowledge as well and nutrition knowledge even. And uh, I think we need, you know, I think we're going to naturally go back into our, the old ways.